And uh, next we're going to have uh, co-presentations by uh, some of our collaborators, actually collaborators with our center director, Dr. Rothram Boris, who's here in the front row with us, uh, I think over the past six years. And this is actually using mobile phones with um, community health workers. And I think those will be the people we will see being deployed with this uh, kind of uh, microscope technology, hopefully in the near future. Um, so we'll have um, uh, these two presenters and then followed by another presenter. We'll do two in a row because they're both very similar uh, types of technologies and the two presentations are complementary and, and then we'll have questions for those two groups on the community health worker platforms after the three of them present. So it's Dr. Uh, Professor Mark Tomlinson who's uh, from the Department of Psychology at Stellenbosch University and he's a visiting professor at the Center for Public Mental Health, Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at University of Cape Town. And he was the principal investigator on Good Start 3 and Polani Plus. And Dr. Rotherham was the uh, US principal investigator on Polani Plus. And with him is uh, Andy Friedman, who uh, has a, a, a bachelor's in science and engineering and is the managing director of Mobenzi, uh, who are based in Cape Town. And they are the mobile phone uh, programming uh, company. Uh, great. So, Thanks, Dallas. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what to say after that presentation. My part of me just wants to leave the room, and um, the other one wants to sort of say is that, that Dr. Osgan should have gone last. So, um, but yeah, fantastic presentation. So um, ours, uh, we think, is very important, if if not as as sexy. But hopefully, I'll still I'll still be able to keep you awake. Um, we um, I'm going to talk about two. I'm going to talk about um, two projects that, that I've been involved with for the last um, six, six and a half years. Um, and our sort of guiding principle of, the, of both studies, but certainly um, when we started, um, was that even then, and I think it's true now, is that we, we know a lot about what works, but most of what we know what works works in, in sort of efficacy studies or even strictly controlled effectiveness studies, and that what happens when these are taken to scale in whatever area it is, whether it's an HIV treatment prevention, maternal or neonatal or child health, that when those get taken to scale, and all of a sudden we're having to implement using larger numbers of community health workers, they, they fail. Um, our guiding, our sort of principle and our argument is that the main reason for that is supervision and management. Is that we, we know how to do it with supervise and, and, and manage community health workers in small numbers where we have strict control and the minute it goes to scale or we have increased distances, rural versus urban, things go wrong. So I'm just put the slide up. I, I, I would imagine most in the audience know most of this. Um, um, and, and that given the budgets in, in, in most countries, and I, I come from South Africa, which, which is, is rich by comparison to most African countries and is, is, is an upper middle income country these days, um, the, the kinds of budgets we're talking about are, 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 are very low. Um, and we have to find low cost, low cost plus platforms, whether that's around delivering the intervention or certainly in terms of um, supervision and management. So as I've said, there's this gap between small-scale efficacy studies and large-scale um, interventions. Um, and and that, that supervision and management is absolutely central here. Um, and that one of the main, or one of the, one of the core components of that is timely and high-quality information. Whether this is about whether community health workers are actually delivering the intervention, um, and that's certainly at scale. We know from South African experience that's an enormous issue in terms of making sure that community health workers are kind of delivering the intervention that they've been trained to deliver. Um, but also, once, once they're in the home, what, what kinds of messages are being, um, are being delivered and the quality of those, of those messages. Um, and the, the more you go to scale, the more dispersed the community health workers are, and then the more dispersed um, the supervisors are. And, and supervision in many projects, even in, even in, in, in fairly small scale studies, um, I know of a number of cases of studies in, in certainly southern Africa where supervision happens be between one, only once every, every sort of four to six weeks. That's the level of the face-to-face of the, of the su face -face supervision. So we need to find ways to, 
to, um, to deal with that. Um, this is just a, a, a model um, on, on supervision, and it, and it just really, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, it just really speaks to the kinds of information flows that we, that, that we need, and it's about the quality of that, of the, of the information that supervisors get, and it's about the feedback that then community health workers or the frontline worker is able to get from the, from the supervisor. So I'm going to talk about two studies. The, this, this, the first study was, is, is, is a study called Good Start 3. Um, and this was a study that I started um, together um, with a number of, a number of collaborators. Um, and my, my boss at the time, um, who's now with UNICEF, Mickey Chopra, we were starting the study and we, we thought, based on a, a Good Start 2 study, we, we decided we didn't want to use paper anymore for data collection. So at that point, it didn't have anything to do with supervision. It was purely about data collection. We met with a couple of companies. Their turnaround time was too long. And so we sat in a coffee shop with, with Andy about six, six and a half years ago. Um, and his turnaround time, I think, at that point as a new company was about a week, I think. And so we went with, with Andy. And it was, at that point, literally about using mobile phones for data collection. Um, and since then, that's, that's all our data collection takes place. On, on mobile phones. We have very little paper. In fact, in, fact, in Polani studies I'll speak about, the only paper we have is informed consent forms. Um, so Good Start 3, which has now, now been completed, um, was an effect in the study of an integrated community-based um, project for maternal newborn child in, and it was based in Umlazi, which is, a, which is an area in Durban. Um, it was a cluster randomized controlled trial, um, and the focus was, was it wasn't as a vertically integrated program. It covered more than simply exclusive and appropriate feeding. It, it included aspects of uh, across the, the broad range of the PMTCT cascade. Um, and one of our funders was uh, Saving Newborn Lives. So we had a very specific focus on, um, ne of, on illness detection. Um, and, and a core component of that in terms of neonatal illness and neonatal survival is, is as most of you know, is that first 24 to 48 hours. So uh, also about, so not purely about the supervision and management, but also about man finding ways to get community health workers into the household in that first, that very vital first 24 to, to 48 hours. Um, it was a partnership with the Medical Research Council, Stellenbosch, um, a number of universities in the Western Cape, um, Saving Newborn Lives, um, and, and a Swedish um, partners as well. Um, and the, the funding was from Saving Newborn Lives and the Centers for Disease Control here in the US. Um, Polani Plus um, is, the, is the second study, also a cluster randomized control trial, um, and this started a number of years after Good Start 3, and this one's based in, in Cape Town. Um, a core difference between the two studies is that the Good Start study is the research team was responsible for everything. We did training, we did the data collection, um, two teams were quite separate, but they still were within the ambit of the Medical Research Council. The Palani Plus model is a, is, is a very different one, and, and one that I think is a very useful one. So we partnered, and it was UCLA with uh, Dr. Mary Jane Rotherham is here, and, and ourselves at Stellenbosch University as the, sort of the data side, and we partnered with an existing NGO called Palani Nutrition Projects. Um, and they have a pedigree of being in, in, in the townships in, in Cape Town for the last 28 years. Um, their model is very much within current South African government kind of guidelines on salaries of community health workers. And so they were responsible for the training for the super, and, and for the supervision and the management of, of the community health workers, um, as opposed to our team in the, in the Good Start 3 study. Um, this study was, was funded by the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse here in the, in the US. Um, just some very brief project differences. I'm going to let Andy speak to, to, to most of this. Um, and he's going to speak about the, the web-based interfaces that we set up. Um, and it's important that we, when we started Good Start 3, um, we had nothing. We, and we sort of developed the system as we went. And I'm sure he'll speak more to this. And we learned some lessons when we started Polani, but we did some very different things. So in the, in the Good Start study, it was very much structured visits that took place at very particular times. So there were two antenatal visits, there was a visit in the first 24 to 48 hours after birth, then in three to four days, they were about an hour long, fairly structured with, with X amount of information to deliver at each of those visits. The Polani study, on the other hand, 
um, based on some, some lessons that were certainly I'd learned from the Good Start study and many of the lessons that, that, that um, uh, Mary Jane had learned in, in her work in, in, in LA and, and around the world, um, was around trying to allow a little bit more flexibility amongst the community health workers. So one of the things we found in Good Start, for example, is a community health would arrive in a, in a way, sometimes, because they had these messages to deliver in that hour, it became a bit like shoving information down, and it can, down somebody's throat. What we tried to do was, in a way, I suppose you could call it empower, or facilitate a slightly different relationship between the community health worker and the, and the, and the woman in the household, to allow the community health worker to stay, say, right now, this, she's not ready to hear the message, she's ill, or she's busy, um, I'll kind of talk to her for five minutes, and I'll then leave the, the house, and I'll come back tomorrow and reschedule another visit. Um, that's all very well in the real world. When you're doing a randomized control trial, you wanna, you, you're really concerned about dose. So what we did is we, and Andy, I'm sure will show you a picture, developed a system where the community health worker in the Polani study, depending on the, the information they put into the mobile phone, when they, when they enter a house and they leave, we can tote how long they've spent in the house over the course of the perinatal period. So we have a slightly different idea of dose to the Good Start study. But just so that you get a sense of these two studies, and I'm, I'm, I think Andy will kind of speak to, speak to both, but they have um, very particular differences in terms of how we, how we delivered them. Okay, and I'm gonna hand over to Andy, and then I'll say a couple of words at the end. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, it's amazing, after six years um, working with Mark, the turnaround time doesn't seem to have shifted out from that one week that we initially got, so some things don't change. But I'm going to talk a bit about the technology aspects um, that, were, um, that were worked on as part of these projects. So both of the projects relied heavily on data collection. Obviously, being research projects, there was a fair amount of data that, both, that needed to be collected both for research and for program purposes. So we had an existing platform called uh, Researcher, uh, which we used for the mobile data collection component. But there were some systems and project protocols that needed to be supported on top of pure data collection. Um, as Mark's mentioned, um, in the Good Start project, for example, there were specific time points at which uh, mothers needed to be visited and specific topics which need to be covered at those time points. Um, whereas with the uh, Polani project, there was a lot more fluidity um, in terms of how much time a field worker could spend with a mother as well as uh, when she could be visited. But there were a lot of commonalities as well. So what we did was to try and distill those commonalities to form another layer uh, on top of or alongside researcher which has become known as outreach. Um, and I'll talk a bit about both of those platforms now to give you a sense uh, as to what kinds of technologies were at play and how they were used. Okay, so to start off on the mobile side of things, um, the mobile application is obviously a, crit a critical element here. Um, it allows for a number of, uh, of, of activities such as data collection, visit guidance, and event reporting. And I just want to touch on a couple of the key aspects here um, in terms of what was important initially. Uh, as Mark has, me has mentioned, the costs and the budgets involved are very low. So we initially started off using very, very low in handsets. Um, the initial handsets we used were, I mean, they had less than 512 kilobytes of RAM, if that means anything to you. Um, most phones nowadays have hundreds of megabytes even, similar to how computers uh, have evolved. So we used very familiar low-cost feature phones. And I just want to emphasize the familiarity aspect here. You don't want to be introducing technology which is going to confuse and intimidate people. Um, and that was one of the key things we wanted to do, was use very, very simple handsets, the candy bar, design, if you will, um, so that our field workers would not feel that this was something new and foreign to them. Um, we now support over 500 different types of handsets across four different platforms, such as Java, Android, Blackberry, and Windows Mobile. The mobile app is responsible for the collection of both routine and research data. And the, the whole point of it is to try and simplify what can be quite a complex uh, interaction of perhaps collecting 200 or 300 or 400 uh, the researchers like to push the numbers high all the time, um, fields of data, and uh, capture that information in a, in a simple way, in a, in a, a wizard-driven approach. Um, so the forms themselves that need to be captured as part of the project protocol were loaded onto the mobile phone um, and executed one step at a time. 
Importantly, there was often no cell phone reception, so the technology had to be able to work in network poor conditions. So the system works by storing the data locally on the handset and uploading it automatically when a cell phone uh, connection is made. Um, and that's obviously a key point in terms of being able to work in rural areas where you may have network reception from time to time, but you can't rely on it to do a round trip. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the standard researcher web console um, that that was available and which exists now and talk about how that was used um, and how that laid the foundation for the next piece. The first thing, as I mentioned earlier, was that form data, uh, data collection in the, uh, by means of forms and surveys was a critical component. So a web-based system allows you or allowed them to design forms and deploy those directly to, to the field workers, uh, incorporating multiple data types, logic flows, validation to try and improve data quality and guide the field worker through the process of collecting uh, both routine and, and research data. Real-time data availability is obviously a key aspect to supervision and management, making sure that you can get data back from the field within a few minutes generally and be able to analyze and, and interpret it. Um, we've now sort of expanded on that by allowing complex filters to be designed uh, and reports stored, which can then be shared with a variety of individuals and stakeholders right up and down the, the chain of command, if you will. Geographic visualization um, is also obviously a key aspect to this to make sure that data is being collected where it's supposed to be coming from and you can also see patterns emerging uh, in terms of uh, certain trends that could be emerging from the data set that are coming through. And then lastly I just want to talk a bit about the API which stands for an application programming interface and this is where the technology starts to come to the fore a little bit. There's two key points that I want to sort of discuss here. The first is the ability to take action on data coming through in, in near real time. Generally speaking, the data is available instantly, but depending on network conditions, it might be delayed by a few moments. Um, but when the data does arrive, it allows you to do a variety of things, such as generating reports, scheduling follow-up visits, sending adherence reminders, notifying a community health worker to go back and, and check on a piece of data that has been perhaps entered incorrectly. So this availability of real-time data really underpins our ability to take control of the situation and to guide and assist. And the second key API element that I want to mention is our ability to manipulate and pre-populate forms before we send them down to a field worker. So if a field worker is, in, is intending to go and visit a, a pregnant mother today, we can embed all of the pregnancy information that is on file, perhaps from the clinic or from a previous visit, and contextualize that visit, uh, allowing her to provide a more focused care. Um, but these projects needed a little bit more um, than what the standard features were from the projects that we developed. Um, so we built some custom web interfaces using this API that I've just mentioned. And I just want to give a couple of screenshots taken from the systems uh, to kind of give you a view as to, uh, as a manager, a data manager, or a principal investigator, or as a coordinator, the types of screens that you would be looking at in terms of trying to manage the project. So I've taken just three screenshots here looking at household level data, participant tracking information, and what we call interaction tracking. And um, Dallas showed one of, one of these images earlier. Um, this is looking at one particular patient uh, or participant and immediately being able to see what topics have been covered with that patient. So I'm talking about the antenatal and postnatal diagram in the foreground. Uh, seeing what topics have been covered during each phase of pregnancy um, as well as how much time cumulatively has been spent with that particular participant. And obviously all of this information updating daily as uh, forms are being submitted by community health workers. From a visit scheduling and a roster management perspective, the system also needed to schedule visits based on what was coming through from the field. So once a mother has been identified as being pregnant, uh, antenatal and postnatal visits need to be scheduled to ensure that the correct topics are being covered at the correct periods of time uh, through her pregnancy. So what we needed to do um, was to look at what the commonalities were across these projects and others. And several things uh, came to the surface when we did that. The first was the need for a secure and longitudinal patient record keeping system. The second was this tremendous flexibility which was required in terms of protocol, um, how visits needed to be scheduled, who could schedule them, what to do when a visit was missed, which was perhaps critical, and how to escalate that information, and a variety of other time-based uh, protocols. Providing contextual visit support, as I've mentioned, and our ability to communicate with both community health workers in terms of um, providing them with, for example, a summary of what the day was that laid ahead or the week that lay ahead, as well as patients. Referral and integration with facilities 
and highly configurable web interfaces. So those screens that I've shown you now, being able to develop those with relatively low cost. So this was kind of the, um, the, the set of requirements that we used to build this outreach platform. So outreach sits as a layer on top of researcher, as I've mentioned. Uh, researcher being responsible for the low level, what we call the transactional data and outreach being responsible for interpreting and connecting the information in, in a relational way. And then on top of outreach, we're able to build various interfaces for uh, team leaders, community health workers, and anyone else who might be involved in the project. So the first piece of that then is the mobile interface, which can be tailored for the various stakeholders, be they community health workers, team leaders, and so on, allowing them to do their day-to-day -day task. And this mobile interface is intended to run on one of those 500 handsets that I've mentioned. The back end then is not something that is seen by, the, the, by, by any of the team, but allows us to build up what we call entities. And entities are simply a way of storing data that is grouped in some way. So an entity could be a patient, a facility, or a visit, and this entity is a data structure that can evolve over time. The screenshot that I've actually shown you there is generated by the system itself as you design um, your conceptual structure of how you want to fit pieces of information together. It allows the forms that are being captured using mobile phones to be knitted together and stored in a relational manner and, and, and interpreted over a period of time. From these data structures, these entities, we're then able to generate contextual forms which guide the field worker through follow-up visits and subsequent interactions. We can also generate and distribute automated reports, send text messages, uh, and integrate with third-party systems such as uh, a DHIS, a district health information system, the one we have in South Africa. And then finally, the need for web interfaces. Uh, and this replaces a lot of the need for the custom development that we were going through with each of these projects. We wanted to get rid of that hardcore software development, which is very expensive and time consuming because we were only be get, being given one week turnaround times, um, and provide this rapid configuration environment. Um, and many of the common web interfaces that you'd expect to see, so I want to view a patient, I want to edit a patient's data, or I want to search for a patient, are built in and generated dynamically using this architecture. And it is an open architecture, with the idea being that whilst we may have built the platform, we expect and we hope that other organizations will start to build their own web interfaces and their own widgets, as we call them, on top of these entities. And you can start to incorporate maps, charts, grids, and all other kinds of data visualization elements. We built in granular permissions management, and essentially it's a web-based design environment. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview as to the technologies that were involved, and I'd like to hand back to Mark, who will probably give you the reality check on what I've told you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Andy. I mean, just maybe I'll just put that up to to discuss. It just is is I think we also have to be a little bit cautious. I mean, unlike. Dr. Oscan, Rapid Diagnostics, what we're involved with in is behavior change. And there's a lot of things happening in M Health, which f for me, frankly, it's as if there's never been a theory about behavior change. Um, how we imagine two SMSs will solve um, gender violence. Um, there may be a theory and there may be evidence, um, but I do want to see it. And so I think we have to be very careful that this technology will not save us from the end of the end of the cliff but but equally I also just want to sort of have a um, the other side of it is that's not as you can see we've been deeply embedded in this for the last sort of six seven years I'm a complete convert and believer in the in the technology and in M health and it is it, it offers enormous potential but I think we have to be cautious and 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 sort of scale some of the expectations down down a little um, yeah, and I'd just also just like to say thank you to all the, the mothers and the, the babies and the children in our studies. Thank you.